and welcome to the Shepherd's Heart. We've got Pastor Humberto Porras, Rabbi Muddle Ballastin, <laughs> and Steve. <laughs> we, uh, we like to look at the scriptures from a, a unique perspective, from a, a Jewish-based perspective, but we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. We've been going through the parables of Jesus. We call them Yeshua, the parables of Yeshua. And um, oftentimes they have to do with agriculture, things growing and things living. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to turn things over to Muddle Ballastin. Okay, so here is the scripture reading from Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to be starting to read in verse 26. Mark 4, 26. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And that's the portion talking about a very different sort of thing from where I grew up in Brooklyn in New York City. <laughs> you didn't do a lot of planting, we, huh? We didn't do a lot of planting. <laughs> the one attempt I made of agriculture was in uh, PS 272, our school garden. We had a little tiny plot of, of very bad soil in the middle <laughs> of New York City and tried to make something grow, and it did not uh, because we started, we later found out, with bad seed. Uh, <laughs> but here, the picture is of the gospel seed, yes. is of the fact that the gospel seed is miraculous. When the good news of Messiah is sown and shared, there's something inside that gospel seed that is energized. It has a dynamo within it that is able to accomplish great things. Here it's very small, a little seed, and yet great things can be accomplished. Once the sower correctly sows the seed, maybe covers it up a little bit, he walks away. So it has very little to do with the sower. Right. And it has everything to do with the designer of the seed and the one who created the seed. I mean, if you think about it, it's magical. <laughs> yeah, to um, use a word that... It's has, popular. And, but it has mixed connotations. It does. But it's it's but, miraculous. But imagine you took your, your automobile and you went and stuck it in the dirt and you dug out two. <laughs> or anything. You know, anything we have. But, and not just two, a, a hundred. Sounds good. And then you take that seed, you put it in the ground, it comes up with a plant that makes lots of seeds. And then you take one of those seeds and put it in the ground. It comes out with a plant. And this has been going on for thousands of years. All you need is one car. And you can give everybody in the world a car. I mean, it, it, it's miraculous. It's magical. It's mm -hmm. talking about the power of the creator, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. About the, it's talking about the power of the programmer. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> every seed has a program in it. The seed has been pre-programmed. Mm -hmm. And so all you need to do is, uh, is drop the seed in the ground. You don't drop it in and tell it, like, you're not a tomato, you're a watermelon. Remember, you're a watermelon. You don't have to tell it it's a watermelon. It knows it's a watermelon, okay? So once you, you put it in the ground, it knows what it is. It knows how to grow. It knows what, produce to, uh, what a fruit to produce. It has already been pre-programmed. So again, that's something very important to us because a lot of times we want to imagine that so much depends upon us in order for the kingdom of heaven <laughs> to function and to go on. We're kind of like Elijah, Lord, I'm, I'm the last prophet. After me, your whole <laughs> kingdom's going down the path. There's no hope no more. <laughs> well, no, there's hope. There's still hope because it's not about us. It's about the seed that is going to be planted. It's all about the seed. And so when we begin to see the scripture, we understand again, uh, the power that is in the Word of God. The Bible says that we have been reborn out of a incorruptible seed. 
The word of God that lives and God. abides forever. And if you look at, at uh, human beings or anything, a lot of times when a baby is born with a deformity, mm -hmm. it's because the seed had a problem transmitting the correct information. Mm -hmm. There was something in the code that went wrong. And so when it transmitted it, it has no arm or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible says that the, that the word of God is incorruptible. It will always pass the right code along. The code that will produce men and women like the image of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the code is all about. The Bible says that the code is until we all come into the full knowledge of Jesus, until we have matured fully into the image of Jesus, that is what the seed is for in our lives. I like that, huh? Programming thing. Yeah. And the data thing. And another aspect of it is um, power. What I mean by that is, you know, I went to the car. Mm -hmm. But it takes a factory a lot of energy to make a car. Yes. Where's that energy come from? I mean, you have a seed. It's yeah. not plugged into a generator or a power plant. It, it has life in itself. Amazing. And you go to Genesis and God says he would have seeds that reproduce, that have life in themselves. Yeah. It's a little ball of life. And as we've seen elsewhere, they can be so small you can barely see them some seeds. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just think, um, I don't know, I, I honor God for the amazing and remarkable thing he has done. Mm -hmm. And again, the power of Jesus Christ, he described himself as a seed in a certain place. He said, if this seed doesn't fall into the ground and die and perishes, it's not going to bear any fruit. Mm. But if it dies and it perishes, then it sprouts out life. So it was necessary for him to die. But the Bible says there would be a fruit that would cause great joy in his life and to see all of this fruit of people that are converted and transformed. So even in that death, there was power to overcome death. There was power to overcome sin. There was power to overcome all of these things. And then he gives us new life. We have new life in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, like, uh, I like the ignorance of the farmer here. <laughs> he sleeps, he gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. And, and we can see God work in that. You know, as I see the ministry where God has placed me, you know, I don't need to be trying to take credit for everything because <laughs> a lot of these things I didn't know. I couldn't plan. I couldn't get them to happen. But God has everything programmed already. And what he desires of me is obedience is trust and to follow him. And as I do that, then I see a road that is opened up before me. But I don't have to be, you know, killing myself trying to figure it out or making it up as I go. I can just choose to trust God and follow God. Now in that, I mean, there's certain things that he wants to produce that he's gonna cause me to do something in order for it to be produced. But again, God is working it out, God is doing it. So it's not something that I've got to put on my shoulders, it's God's kingdom. Is God's power. Nice. Muddle, anything else on this kingdom of God being like a man who scatters seed? The, the, the seed aspect of it is, is, you know, it's a, on one hand, it doesn't depend upon us to do anything. And yet God invites us to help with the planting. Yes. So, I mean, he could do it all by himself. He doesn't need us. So we should really feel honored that we've been invited into this miraculous process and that he deigns, he agrees to use us, desires to use us, would prefer to use us if we would allow ourselves to be used. It's a holy calling. It's a, it's a prestigious job title. Yes. You know, and, and you don't have to go to seminary to do it. You don't have to have five Bible degrees. You know, you don't have to be good looking like Umberto here. You know, be stand up at the pulpit and handsome pastor. You I have know, to buy you a lot of steaks. Yeah, I'm, really, I'm gonna have a big tab by the time this is over. <laughs> so, any ordinary, you know, Jose can do this. Mm -hmm. Any ordinary person is able to take the simplest things in the gospel, which is the dynamic seed. And you can be confident that if you properly just put the seed in, in the proper type of ground, it's not on you to cause it to spring up. 
but if it has found fertile ground in a heart that's yielded to God, God will cause it to burst forth. Sure. You need to plant the seed. To use another metaphor that's related, one man plants, another man waters, yes. but God gives the increase. That's right. God's the one who makes it happen. And I like how you said you don't have to have a, a Bible degree. In that's fact, right. Sometimes that even gets in the way. <laughs> yes. You just have to have a willing heart. Right. The desire to be used of God. And I loved how you said it. You know, yes, we work, but we don't have to stress about planning it and figuring it all out. Just let God open the way and this is the way, walk in it. You know? Exactly, exactly. I was reminded of Moses when you were saying that. Up against the sea on one hand, up against the Egyptians on the other hand, and the people were moaning and complaining because we're so good at it. And Moses prays to God and he says, why are you crying out to me? Lift up your staff. Part the waters. Yeah. Like, duh, <laughs> you should have known. What, what's wrong with you people? Yeah, when Jesus spoke to his disciples, he told them, you're coming into a field that others worked. Mm, they yeah. prepared the work. They labored day and night. And now you're called just to pick up the harvest of what they've done. So again, all glory goes to God. It's not about the one that sows or the one that is going to reap. It's really belongs, the glory belongs to the God. And, and yes, we need a lot of help because the Bible says, Jesus said, the, 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 the field is ripe and then there's, there's, the harvest is ready, but there be very few laborers. So when, when this thing ripens, we need to pick up the harvest or, or it's going to get ruined. So again, we need a lot That's of right. laborers to get involved in this ministry, not just one pastor, it's everybody. When you quoted that he, you're entering into other people's labors, yeah. I can't think of the context offhand, and I'm going to need you to remind me. Okay. But I remember when God was taking the children of Israel back to Egypt again, right. uh, out of Egypt, he said, I'm going to bring you into towns that you didn't build, into mm -hmm. houses you didn't build. You're going to have vineyards that you didn't plant. It's almost just stepping into a full new life that you worked not for at all. And he said, be careful because you're going to forget the mm -hmm. Lord your God. Yeah. So, so how, how does that context of entering into the labor? I think it's the same context. It's, it's, it's for them, again, not, not to uh, become proud, for That's them right. not to become arrogant about it. They're actually walking into fields that others labored, others mm. worked very hard into. And if we look at our life, that's how we look at our life. You know, we are who we are because of our parents, because of uncles, because of people that came before us. In ministry, there's people that sold into our lives, and if it would not have been for them, we wouldn't be here today. So again, we're not a self-man made or ministry or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are always involved in anyone having any kind of success. And so we always need to be uh, cognizant of that. We need to be grateful of that. So it's not about us. Others came before us and when we were finished, we need to pass yeah. on to somebody else. Uh, many, many years ago, the uh, Coopers felt a call to start a television network and we had nothing to do with that. Yeah, it's a right. long time ago, lots of labor, lots mm -hmm. of joy, sweat, and tears, yes. many experiences. And then here we happen along. <laughs> and uh, they're like, hey, come on and, and join in where we've labored. And mm -hmm. they're thrilled to have us. Right, right. You know, and we're thrilled to serve. Mm -hmm. But you're right. We yeah. didn't do the work. And when we're gone, there will be others behind us. Exactly. The, the good things that occur as a result of our labors Ultimately, who is bringing about those good things? It's the Lord of the harvest. Yes. We are the facilitators. We can carry the seed. But, uh, you know, if we just carry our own invention, it's not going to do anything. Right. It's a miraculous. I have a, a quick story. I have a friend who many, many years ago, he, here he is. He's a Jewish guy with, a, with two earned PhDs. He is agnostic. And he was just given the task of supervising four people and doing a research project for a large corporation with also government money with one of the latest electron microscopes. And it was a wonderful medical project. He had to understand why certain cell walls were able to resist disease and other cell walls just let the disease through. They were trying to come up with a cure for certain diseases. As he's watching through his electron microscope live, as he introduces pathogens, diseases, onto that laboratory slide, he sees this supposedly dumb cell marshal its resources and in an example of intelligence, 
fights off the disease pathogen. And as he's watching this, all of what he had been taught in universities, master's degrees, whatnot, about the cell being a product of random, dumb chance, struck him as being the height of folly. This, there's nothing dumb about this. Mm -hmm. This is the design of an intelligent designer. So if there is a design in the cell that I'm looking through this multi-million dollar Microsoft, seeing proof of design, who is the designer? Mm. And then this agnostic Jewish scientist went on a search for the designer. He ultimately came face to face with believers in Messiah who were able to take him through Genesis, show him the designer, and he came to faith. About six months after he came to faith, I got to meet him. Um, he wound up in the fellowship back in my earliest years where I was doing praise and worship on the guitar since 30 years ago and uh, had the privilege of partially discipling him. But he was able to see God's design in a single seed and he was able to see the dynamism that God designed into that seed. If God designed dynamism into a seed, how much more so the gospel message. It is, is changes lives, it changes countries, it changes civilizations. So we need to get out there and start scattering some more seed, don't we? <laughs> and trusting in God, because you quoted a scripture, you said that someone plants and someone waters, but then it says God gives the increase. Yeah. So again, we can plant and we can water, but if God doesn't give the increase, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So again, we always got to be dependent upon God and the power of God as we preach the gospel or whatever. It's not about us. It's about God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how's that passage go? Unless the Lord builds the house, they it's labor in vain. vain who try to build it. Yes. Yeah. And man may try to figure out where he's going, but God directs his steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we always have to, mm -hmm. to steer things back to God and give Amen. credit where credit is due. Good. I feel sometimes like a little grain of speck, mm -hmm. a little, a little nothing. There's God of the universe. He knows these things, and we take advantage of them. We take them for for granted. Yeah. But he's 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 pretty awesome, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do I get an amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> All right. Anything further about this uh, seed that's self-producing and self-growing? No, actually, it, this is immediately before the next parable in Mark. So if you want, I can go ahead and read that one. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Because it really, one feeds right into the other. Mm -hmm. So the next parable to consider is immediately following in the Mark account. So Mark chapter 4, verses thirty. Through 32. I'll read that to you. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when it is planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. So all of this is about the kingdom of God. This small mustard seed, the Israeli variety, which is so small, some of them, you can barely see them with the naked eye. Yep. And yet when they grow, they grow so big that birds can make their homes in them. Mm -hmm. I remember the mustard plant I first came across, it was on the banks of the Jordan River, more or less, right in that wash, it, that area where the Jordan would be when it swells. Yes. And uh, the one we were looking at was probably about eight feet high, I'd say, mm -hmm. and very bushy, yeah. you know. And we grabbed a pod off of there and crinkled it into our hand, and we were just all stunned. Stunned. We, we understood what Yeshua was saying about the mustard seed, mm -hmm. but we really didn't get the power of it until we saw the, side of the size of the seed itself. I guess it pales in comparison to your cell electron microscope a moment yeah. ago, which is a remarkable story. But again, it speaks about it, uh, how the kingdom of heaven seems so insignificant and inconsequential in the mind of man, in, in, in the pride of man, in the pride of life. It, it seems so small 
So, uh, you know, it's really not very powerful or strong. And if you look again at the nation that God chose, it's one of the smallest nations in all of the world. And God says, I didn't choose you because you were the strongest. I didn't right. choose you because you were the greatest, but because I loved you. And so, again, we see how God uh, chooses this little thing. And yet this little thing makes news all around the world. All the world is fascinated by it. All the world is captured by it. All the world is talking about it. But yet it's so small and so insignificant. Which is evidence that God's got his hand on it, that God's involved in it. I don't remember the numbers, but they're stunning. Like the number percentage-wise of Nobel Prizes won by Jewish people. Yes. And the influence of Jewish people on medicine and science and art and entertainment yeah. and um, food. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here we're talking about the kingdom of God, which starts off small and then grows. Yes. Yeshua came, got 12 disciples. Now, there were others who followed him, maybe 120 by the time it was all said and done mm -hmm. after three years of ministry. Uh, one of them notably, though there were many, but one of them notably went out everywhere he could possibly go, preaching the message of Yeshua. The next thing you know, at the mighty Roman Empire was conquered yeah. by this invisible mustard seed. Yeah. It flourished, and though it was unhealthy the way it came about in the end, after a couple hundred years, it became the religion of Rome. Yes. And it became then the largest religion on the planet. For a number of years. Yeah. So again, speaking about the power that is in the kingdom of God, the power that is exercising upon the world, a lot of times I think we can be very worried about what's going on in the world. We see the kingdoms of the world. We see the kings of the world. And we imagine them to be so powerful. We imagine them to be so big and so large. But yet, they're really insignificant in the eyes of God. They really are not that powerful as we might imagine. Now, I uh, still remember today the message that I preached uh, on the day that... Uh, the towers fell in New York in the morning, on that Sunday morning. Mm. And the message that I preached was something that I learned as something happened to me. I was out working at the church, and we were building the church. We are working at the church. And when I was building, all of a sudden, something bit me here, and it was a little ant about that small. But by the time I got home, all my knee had grown this large, and wow. I could not hardly walk. Wow. And so that happened like a Friday or a Saturday. And so I got my message for Sunday. And the message was, even though America is so large and so powerful, even a little ant can stop and even a little ant can mm. humble it if we don't choose to humble ourselves. And so again, that really bears to mind the power that is in the kingdom of God. We imagine, you know, the things that we see in the world are so large and so powerful. And, you know, what can a little Christian woman do? What can a little Christian old guy do? What can a little old rickety Christian church do? But yet there is great power there because it is the kingdom of heaven that is working and operating there. And so I think this is an invitation for us not to ignore that power mm -hmm. that is in the kingdom of heaven. I do have a tendency sometimes to fret, to feel like we're overwhelmed and outmatched, yeah. that the world is making bigger inroads than we are. It obviously is. And if it wasn't for what I knew about the word of God, I could despair. But I know what's going to happen. God wins. <laughs> we, 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 we've read the last chapter of this story. And, and the kingdom of heaven will take over this planet as Daniel's vision, of uh, the vision that's recorded in Daniel about uh, the stone cut off without hands, yes. smashes the feet of the idol yes. and grows and becomes a great mountain. And its kingdom becomes a kingdom that will never end. Exactly. And I, I think we're, we're close to those days. I pray to God that we are. So all of these great and mighty things that we see now, we marvel again in, in, the, in, in, the, in the Bible, they actually started out very small and very insignificant. Mm -hmm. the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, King David, when he comes to slay the giant. I mean, he had ruddy little red cheeks, you know, everybody imagined him, who is this guy, what can he do? But he slew the giant. When the savior of the world came into the world, he was a little baby, a small little baby, was born in a manger, a very lowly and significant mm -hmm. place. So again, the beginning seems so small, so 
uh, so not very powerful, but yet the result of it is very powerful. Like uh, the story of Gideon, I don't remember the numbers. 300. But they were outnumbered who knows how many to how many. And then God told Gideon, no, there's too many of you. (laughs) (laughs) So all of you who got recently married or scared, um, I don't know, had a bad day, whatever, (laughs) just go home. And uh, nope, there's still too many of you. And God got it down to, yeah, 300 to defeat an entire army. Exact same idea. The scriptures say, do not despise the day of small beginnings. And you and God are majority. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. (laughs) You know, you're not outnumbered. It depends on, are you walking with the Lord? Are you in God's program? Is this something that is in his will? Is it? Then you're not outnumbered. One of the prophets had his servant with him, and the village they were in was surrounded by, I think it was the Syrians. At the, I don't remember which, yeah. which group of people it was, Syrians or something. And he, he was scared. And God, he prayed to God, open his eyes so he could see greater are those who are with us mm. than greater are those who are with you, with them. Yeah. We're not outnumbered. They're outnumbered. Yeah. I was watching this, uh, I don't know, some wild, weird show, probably back in the 80s. And uh, there's a couple of guys in a bar. And a whole bunch of big burly guys were going to pick a fight with them. There's like two guys outnumbered by 15. And the guy, the two guys, one of them looks at those 15 guys or whatever it was. He says, this isn't fair. You better go get some more guys. (laughs) (laughs) Same idea. (laughs) Exactly. And so again, I think we're going to have confidence again for the future of the kingdom of heaven. It's not falling apart. It's not going to be undone. Uh, it's going to triumph. It's going to overcome because the Bible says that is the kingdom of God. It will come to this earth. This earth will be transformed. It will be changed because the Bible says that is God's plan and purpose. And nothing can frustrate it and nothing can hold it back. No kingdom, no power, no failure. Nothing can hold it back. Preach it, please. Keep. (laughs) So again, that's what we need to, we look forward to. I mean, Israel is so small and significant looking. Looks like the nations are going to destroy it, but they will never be able to destroy it. I am so looking forward to it. And I know why God's delaying. He's not willing that any should perish, Mm -hmm. but that all should come to repentance. I don't know how things are going in your life right now. My guess is life's a roller coaster. You're either up right now or you're down right now. So if you're up right now, pray for those who are down. And if you're down right now, don't despair because you know the Lord's coming back. His kingdom will reign supreme. We'll see you because we're coming back too. Hi, welcome to The Shepherd's Heart. My name is Steve Shermet, and I'm here with Messianic Rabbi Muddle Ballaston and our friend Humberto Porras, Senior Rabbi of Camino de... <laughs> Iglesia del Camino. Iglesia del Camino. Um, Spanish is not my first language. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I speak a little. Yes, indeed. A, a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of Yiddish, a little bit of English. <laughs> Especially all the colorful words in Yiddish. <laughs> And all the tacos and enchiladas in Spanish. <laughs> I speak menu. <laughs> in five different languages. <laughs> well, we, we, we've been going through the parables of, of Yeshua, looking at the New Testament and some of the stories Jesus told to both reveal information and to conceal information. Mm-hmm. And one, one of the parables we're going to look at now is one of the most famous ones he told. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, I'm going to ask you to read the text, and we'll, we'll dive right into it. All right. This is going to be found in uh, Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. And it says, And he said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now many days la- later, the, young, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, And there he squandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He arose and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion 
and ran and embraced him and kissed him. So this is a parable that goes on, but you know, there's so many points here that I don't want us to miss out on any of them. All right. And then at the end, it goes into something else that's almost different if we want to discuss it, if we have time. But again, this parable is again speaking about something that is lost. Before this parable, we, we see a, a sheep that was lost. We see a coin that was lost. And now he comes to a son that was lost. And so he speaks to us about a certain man. We can imagine it's probably a rich man. And the Bible says that he had two sons, an elder son, he had a younger son. So the Bible says that in the process of time, the younger son decides that he wants to leave his father's house. He wants to come uh, out from underneath the covering of his father because somehow he's got an idea that life is better outside. Maybe he's run into some friends that tell him, man, everything's great outside, man. It's just great. It's a wonderful thing. What are you doing here? And so the Bible says he probably falls for that, right? And so the word of the Lord says that he comes to his father and he says, I want you to share uh, my inheritance with me. So one of the words that we've been learning about in, in Hebrew is chutzpah, chutzpah. So this young man had a lot of chutzpah <laughs> because look at this guy. He's not even waiting for his father to die and he's already wanting the inheritance. Yeah. Because the Bible says that, that the testament is in effect when, when the tester, when the person dies. Yes. So this guy's not even waiting for him to die and he's already wanting the inheritance. That's kind of disrespectful, isn't it? Very much so. And it really shows that there was not a lot of love or concern for the father. Yeah. And really, this is the story of all humanity. There's not a lot of love and concern for God. There's not a lot of love and concern for how I should love God, respect God, serve God, fear God. But there, everybody seems to always be angry when they don't get what they want. Then they usually say, well, where's God? And y'all talk about God. And y'all preach about God. Where's God? Mm -hmm. Because we see God only as some kind of Santa Claus, but we don't see him as a father that we need to love and we need to respect. We don't praise him when things are great. We exactly. just condemn him when things are bad. Exactly. And so again, this is the story about this young man. And again, this is the story of all humanity. The Bible says that we have all been led astray. The Bible said we have all been led astray like a sheep that is lost. Yeah. But the Bible says again that God is calling us back to himself unto repentance. And so again, we see this young man, the Bible says after many days, he got all his stuff together and the Bible says he went away into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. So we see a young man that wanted to get as far away as he could from his father. He didn't want any influence from his father. He didn't want to have to worry that his father was looking at him over his shoulder. Mm. He wanted to get away as far as he could. He was going to live his life. He was going to live la vida loca. <laughs> That's what he wanted. He wanted that life because he was very sure that that was the best life. Mm -hmm. And the Bible does say that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof is nothing more than death. Yeah. Mm. And so the world promises us a lot of things. You know, this young man had his eyes, you know, full of, of, of light. He was just, he knew that life was before him. He knew that the greatest thing he could ever know was before him. And so the Bible says he took off as far as he could go so that he could enjoy his life without his father's influence upon him. He went off to a far country and you said so he could get away from his father. He must have been a really bad dad, huh? <laughs> he didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. It would appear, wouldn't it? But you said he didn't want his father seeing what he was doing living this vida loca. <laughs> You know, who knows? Maybe it was a guilt thing going on. Exactly. You know, there was a, a pop song in the 70s. The refrain said, don't it always seem to know that you, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah. And uh, this fellow ran into that. He didn't know what he had till it was gone. He spent everything there was. A severe famine hit the country and he began to be in need. I don't know. I'm ready to go to the pigs. Where are you at in your thinking through this thing? No, again, he says he squandered everything. So again, so many people, we squander our lives. You know, God has given us giftings. God has given us time. God has given us youth. God has given us family. God has given us a lot of things. And a lot of times we squander our opportunities. 
A lot of people have in their mind to come to Jesus Christ when they're about 68 and a half years old. <laughs> right before they're going to kick the bucket, then they're going to come to the Lord. You know, and they say, I'm going to enjoy my life. And then I'm going to come to this boring life at the yeah. end and there's nothing more. You know, I'll have the best of both worlds. Yeah. I'm going to come when they call me lucky. <laughs> there was a dog in, in, in that I saw one time. And they were inviting people. You know, I've lost my dog. I said, uh, he's missing one eye. One, che one ear has been chewed off. His leg doesn't work. And his name is Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's how people are, right? We despise the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of this earth thinking we're getting a better shake we want this life we'll come to god's kingdom i'm gonna live it up now that's crazy talk exactly so we're gonna come back to god and, and and you know of course god loves us so he's gonna take us and the fact is god does love you and i have heard uh testimonies about people actually coming to christ on their deathbed sure yeah i've heard that and i do believe that but i don't think that we should uh make that our plan well, I don't think a person really can. Yeah. And here's what I mean by that. If you say, I'm not going to come to Messiah now. I'll wait till I'm 68 and a half or on my deathbed. <laughs> and you get hit by a bus. Yeah. Or the thing about coming to Messiah is you love and trust him and want him to save you from your sins. How can you spend the next 40 of your life, years of your life not loving him, not trusting him, not wanting him to save you from your sins? Sure. And then tomorrow, okay, tomorrow I'll love you. Honey, I don't love you today. I'm not going to love you in our marriage for the next 30 years, but on the 31st year, then I'll love you. <laughs> you can't do that. It doesn't but, but, work. But they don't really imagine this relationship as a love relationship. Right, they don't understand. I think they see it as, as purchasing life insurance or, yeah. or, or fire insurance, right. as Muddle has been talking about. And unfortunately, this mistaken way of thinking is putting them in a great danger. But the Bible says well, when this young man squandered everything, then all of a sudden a severe famine arose upon the land. And the Bible says he had a need. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible says uh, that he found himself in need. And there's a saying that says that a, a friend indeed is a friend in need. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Just like that. Yeah. <laughs> so we see this guy in need. And so when he had a lot of money, we could imagine they had friends to throw up in the air, as we say. Right. Yeah. But now that he had a need, then all of a sudden, he can't find a friend. He can't find no one that will open the door to him. And this is the reality when we choose to live a sinful life and choose to walk with certain individuals that do not fear God and really do not love us at all. I've spoken to people about a conversation I had with a gentleman that came to the church one day, and he had been in prison. And he said, he was telling me about what happens when you go to prison, how you're just abandoned and, and, and everybody forgets about you. Nobody but your mama and your grandma and some crazy Protestant preachers are going to go visit <laughs> you there. Nobody else is going to go visit you there. But he said he got out and he came and uh, he said he saw a friend that he had from his childhood that he was living the vida loca with, you know, and when he got into jail and he had spent like eight years there. And so he says, he sees this guy, he's like, wow, when did you get out? He said, well, I just got out there. He said, this next Saturday, I was going to come and visit you. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years, and now he's going to come visit me. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> right, right, right. Fair weather friends. Exactly. So again, that's what we got to be careful about. You know, a lot of times, again, there's a lot of people that are trusting in these people. They're putting all their confidence in them. But when the time comes, they're not going to be there for you. They're there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they can be good friends, but not these guys. So he spent everything. There's a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Well, we learned a few things here, because this is a Jewish context. Yes. So when it says he went out to a far country, we know he went away from Jewish dominion. Yes. He decided to forsake his faith. Yes. That's the implication here. Right. And we know it because wherever he went, they're, sh they're herding pigs. Now, this far country could have been just across the lake. Yes. Because in the area of the Galilee, there was the right. Decapolis. And there were regions that were Gentile controlled and Gentile run. And we know there was a big herd of pigs in that area from another story in the mm -hmm. Gospels. Right. But uh, we know that this man lowered himself so low that he forsook his faith. Yes. And it's hard for us to grasp in our culture what that means because in our culture, most of us are raised with no faith. 
We're a very agnostic, atheistic culture. We don't know the honor of family. We don't know what it means to forsake our people. Yes. But this guy, he didn't just forsake his dad. He forsook God. Yeah. And he fled. And now he's in this pagan country feeding pigs. <laughs> it's the biggest Jewish shame you could think of, pretty much. And this is where he's at. No? No. <laughs> He squandered. Um, the word that Umberto kept using, squandered, really rings true to me because I see it happening in the lives of believers today and in the lives of congregations. Oftentimes when we think of squandering, we think of individuals squandering what uh, God has given to them. But sometimes entire congregations don't recognize the favored position that God has put them in and they squander opportunities to grow. They squander opportunities to bring the gospel to their immediate community. Um, they are passive. They don't take this wonderful gospel dynamic message and let it loose. Instead, as a passive sort of thing, they, they just hope people are going to come through the door. Yeah. And uh, that is almost criminal when you recognize what it is that we have to share with folks. So yes, individuals can squander what God has given to them, but entire congregations can sometimes get into a very passive mindset. I've seen it, and it is a very sad thing, because you realize uh, what God, the favorite position that God had put them in, and yet they squandered that opportunity. Yeah. One thing here that we see about him around the pigs is that the Bible says he desired to eat the pods that the pigs ate. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what pods is, but I know in Mexican culture, you'll feed, feed pigs whatever no one else is willing to eat. Mm -hmm. So if, if the, the dog doesn't want it anymore, you can give it to the pig and the pig will eat it. Wow. So again, the pig represents something that'll eat the filthiest thing, the vilest thing that no one else is willing to eat. And so this is what this young man now was being tempted to eat. Mm -hmm. And when I see this, I see this, how sin really comes to take a person into bondage. Sin, first of all, presents itself as something pretty, something beautiful. A young man imagines himself that he'll only be with the, the most beautiful young lady, with, with the sexiest young lady. And a young lady imagines herself with, with a very handsome man, with a very nice car and all this. But you know, when you get caught up into sin, all of a sudden, you might find yourself wanting to eat the foot of pig, pigs. And that means that you're willing to partake in things that are very shameful. You're willing to do things that you would never imagine yourself doing. But you're going to do them when you get caught up in that lifestyle. And we could put it in a lot of ways. For example, when would David have imagined himself doing what he did to Uriah? Right. When he began all this affair, when did it ever enter in his mind that he was going to be murdering this individual? Mm. It never entered his mind. Yeah. He was just going to have a, a nice little affair. It's going to be a wine night thing. He's just going to, that's it. It's just one time and that no more. But that's the whole deception of sin. And so once he got caught into it, he, it was, he'd been led him into murder. And so this is the same way with all of sin, just like this young man. Eventually, it leads you to wanting to eat alongside of pigs. Mm. And that's the reality of all sin. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of like a, a drug. Yeah. Mm. You know, people try a drug and then it grabs them. Yeah. And then they're stuck into that for years and years and maybe for the rest of their lives. And they're willing to steal from their wife, from their mom, from their children, and do just about anything in order to get that. So again, that's the reality of sin. And a lot of times we want to make light of sin, but sin is not a light thing. It's a very heavy thing. Well, the next verse, thank God, is there. Yes. When he came to his senses. <laughs> he finally woke up. He was like in a spiritual malaise. Yes. His sin made him stupid. Yes. And when he finally fled God and fled his home and squandered his living, he finally snapped out of it. It took being in with the pigs. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And I'm here starving to death. His bad circumstances led him to repentance. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And this is a pattern we see throughout scripture. God blesses people yeah. and they turn from him. Mm. He gives them hard times and they turn toward him. Yeah. And then when we get into the book of Revelation, we see God's wrath and his punishment and his plagues. And he says, and they still won't repent. This is like a new thing. It used to be I could discipline them and they would repent. Now nothing gets through to them anymore. Exactly. They're so hardened and they're so lost. Yeah. But fortunately, this man comes to his senses. But again, the, the, this also is, is a point that is very important to be made. We need to be careful of not being enablers of people that need to experience a little bit of the pain of their sin. Mm. There's actually love in allowing people to experience a little pain for their sin. And one of the reasons that a lot of times people are caught up in something and they never come out is because they always have an enabler. But as we look at this father, he didn't want his son to leave, but eventually he, he let him go. And so there does come a point where we need to let a certain individual go. We need to let him experience a little bit of this pain, a little bit of this shame that his sin is requiring because a lot of times they're not returning because they're not going through that experience. So how, how do we make this practical? Do you have any guidelines or advice for people? I've had to deal with mothers that are having trouble with their children that are ending up in jail and they're spending $500 or they're spending uh, $600 to mm -hmm. get them out of jail. So I say, don't get them out of jail. Leave them there. Mm -hmm. Don't take them out. Okay. Leave them there. And so again, these are things that he's getting himself involved over and over and you're just enabling him, you're, you're allowing him to keep on following his self-deceit, he's deceiving himself, and you're being a part of that instead of being a part of his deliverance. Yeah. So leave him there. Let him experience what his own actions require, and, and that's gonna help him to eventually leave that place. It, it's hard on a mother's heart, but it's the loving thing to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's the right thing to do. Sometimes love is hard. Yes. Yeah, I, I read of a story that it was quite similar. There was this these uh, parents, their kid kept going into jail and he, I swear it's the last time, you know, bail me out. But one time they finally said no more. Yeah. And he was mad and he got angry with them, but it was the thing that turned the corner and he so, ended up coming to his senses. So again, again, there is correction. The Bible says that God, every son that he receives, he receives him with a rod. So there is also correction. So there is a need for that. And people will come to God when they really have a felt need, when they have that felt mm. need. And if they don't, they're not going to come to God. So there is a place for that. And we see this in this, in this scripture. He said, I'll set out. I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I'm not asking you to take me back as your child. I Just can I have a job? <laughs> That's it. C can you give me minimum wage? Yeah. Maybe a roof over my head and then I can have some bread. That's all I'm asking. And he's sincere about it. No. There's a very, very telling thing here about this son. When he left, he was very demanding. He said, give me. Uh, give me my inheritance. But when he comes back, he said, make me. Nice, nice. So that is very important. Because again, when we leave God, it's, we are demanding something as though he owes us something. Mm -hmm. But when we come back, we are coming back as a broken vessel. We're saying, God, make me my life is broken my life is destroyed i have nothing to offer you i have nothing to give you make me which should have been from the beginning our way of being but again when we fall away from that then we can fall into this situation like this young man so he got up and went to his father but while he was still a long way off yes. his father saw him was filled with compassion for him ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him, that he was a long way off and his father ran to him. Amen. I read a book written by uh, a missionary who ministered to some of the, we'll call them natives of the Middle East, yes. who still held to the old ways. And he said, this is unheard of. It's indignant. Right. A father would never hike up his skirts, as it were, and run. That's a shameful thing. Yeah. But the fact that the father did this shows that you the level of his love for his son yes. 
while he was a long way off. It's not like he required his son to come to him and grovel at his feet yes. and say, I hope you've learned your lesson. Yeah. It's almost as if the father was sitting day after day looking down the road, wondering if this mm. is the day his son might just come back. Absolutely. You can envision that the father was praying for his son yeah. probably several times a day. And I just love this passage. He was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. It's not like God is waiting there with a hammer, hoping for us yeah. to transgress so he can smash us. Yeah. God loves us. And it's more like he's waiting there looking down the road for the atheist, yeah. for the God hater, for, for the witch, yeah. for, the, for the Muslim, for, for fill in the blank, yeah. for the jihadi. God's looking down the road, waiting for them to repent. And then when they do, it's not like he wants to smash them. He runs to them, yeah. throws his arms around them. Welcome home. Yeah. So again, a lot of times we in the Christian circle will say that, you know, we, we were looking for God, but, it, but really nobody's looking for God. <laughs> God is the one that's looking for us. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, uh, God somehow provoked you to look for him. Let's put it that way. We can accept that God provoked us to look for him. But it's really not correct to say that we were looking for God because we were not looking for God. Because when you look for him, he's right there. Yes, he's you there. seek, you find. Exactly. Yeah. And he's the one that's looking for us is mm -hmm. the reality. In all of these stories, God is looking for us or he's waiting for us to return because he's interested. He's actively seeking for us to return. That's what he's mm -hmm. wanting. I'm also thankful that Yeshua included in the story the son's repentance, his yes. remorse. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Mm -hmm. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins yes. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I can almost see the father interrupting him. <laughs> Quick, bring the best <laughs> robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast. Sit down, we'll take care of you. You know, <laughs> take a load off. We're going to have a feast. He's back, he's back, he's back. What a Absolutely. We read in another parable how the mm -hmm. angels rejoice in heaven when one sinner repents. Absolutely. Now we're seeing the father rejoice and throwing a party because his son, who was lost to him, yeah. has been found. And in this story, again, we see, and when do we have time to read it, but the second son was not so glad. Yeah. The second son was probably competitive. He was probably thinking, this guy's going to take something that belongs to me. And again, he says, this guy's unworthy. He spent all of your money with prostitutes and bad living. Why are you receiving him that way? And that is the same way a lot of time with people that consider themselves self-righteous. Yeah. Mm. They, don't, they don't understand how or why God would let this person in, why or how this guy should be allowed to come back in. But again, it is because they don't understand the heart of the father. So you look at the first son, didn't really understand the heart of the father. The second son, which seemed to be more obedient and more faithful, did not understand the heart of the father He's either. The, the context of this is, let me read. Okay. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around Yeshua. Yeah. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man mm. welcomes sinners and eats with them. Yeah. Mm. So in this parable, uh, the father is God. Yeah. The prodigal son are the Amharets, the sinning Jewish people, right. the, the ones that they considered unclean. Maybe the prostitutes, maybe the uh, tax collectors. Sure. And the brother who doesn't like to see him be, them being honored, yeah. those are the Pharisees, the scribes, and the teachers of the law. Exactly, exactly. So this story, also one thing that, that I would like to point out, whenever the, the son decided to come back, he never went to the 7-Eleven and asked for a map. Why? Because he knew the way back. And so it's very important for us as believers, if somehow we've strayed away from the Lord, you know, you know the way back, and the way back is the way of repentance. The only way back is through repentance. There's no other way back to God. You can't buy your way, you can't earn your way, but you can repent. And so, you know, God is calling us always to repent. We all stray away, either to the left or to the right, maybe not to the same uh, length of time or whatever, but we all do. And the only way to return, uh, the only way is again to repent so we can return to the Lord. But we know the way. So. Let's get on it. Let's get on it. At the end of the parable, 
to the son that was upset, to the religious leaders mm -hmm. who were upset, he says, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. He doesn't chew him out either. Mm -hmm. yeah. He just tries to adjust his thinking. I love you too. I've always loved you, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead yes. and he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. Mm -hmm. There is no place you can go that God can't save you. Amen. If you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, as the scripture says, you shall be saved. I'm Steve, Muddle, and Umberto. This has been The Shepherd's Heart. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you enjoy this show, we need your support to keep this series on GLC. Please make your checks out to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Please be sure to designate where your contribution is intended. It is very important to let GLC know which programs you enjoy and support. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.